gather house. Gather house. Now, you, this one's interesting. You might not be able to read it, but at the top, right underneath gather house, it says, uh, what is it? As in heaven. Even I'm having a hard time reading it. I've got another page I'll, I'll show you. But right there, they've got it right on the front page, Gather House. This one's interesting. Gather House is a group that is dedicated to nothing but worship and prayer. Their whole goal is to do 24-7 prayer and worship. So if we take a look at the second page here, right here, as it is in heaven. Okay. It says, we are a people unapologetically in love with Jesus, committed to partnering, partnering with heaven. Hmm. And 24-7 prayer and worship, I'll talk about that in a second, determined to give our lives to the work of seeing his kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. Say that again. To give our lives to the work of seeing his kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven through the life-altering love and presence of Jesus. Again, if you're not looking for it, you may not see it. You also have to remember Stephen Furtick. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. So when we do a little bit more digging on who's involved with Gather House, we understand that that falls right in line with the NAR. Before we get to that, the 24-7 prayer and worship. We saw the same thing happen with, I mean, people have already forgotten about it. The Asbury Revival, quote-unquote. That was also 24-7 prayer and worship. No message to be seen. No preaching of Jesus. No preaching of repentance. No preaching of the gospel. No preaching of heaven or hell or sin. Everything that is pretty much needed for that. None of it's there. It was just praise and worship and prayer. This is danger zone. Whenever you see things that's nothing but prayer and worship, you start getting into a danger zone because then what they deem as for Jesus and worshiping Jesus and all this stuff actually becomes a manifestation ritual for all types of spirits and demons. If you don't have somebody directing what this is for and who is who it's about, you're going to have a whole bunch of people praying and worshiping different versions of Jesus, and then you're going to start seeing people who are going to start worshiping Buddha, you're going to start seeing Hindu, you're going to start seeing Muslim, you're going to start seeing a whole bunch of that start to come in because there's no direction, no focus on who we are worshiping to, no direction on who we are praying to. It becomes a manifestation ritual where you're starting to manifest different spirits, and it's not the Holy Spirit. Now, at this point, a lot of people might think, dude, you are reaching, you are out of your mind. I am not. Because NAR churches do the same thing where they're the throne event, 24-hour worship and prayer. Invite everybody that you know. A whole bunch of people start showing up. There's no message given. Even if it was, this NAR church doesn't have a proper idea of who Jesus is. So a false Jesus starts getting thrown out there. You see... How right and almost right comes into play? Do you see the importance of getting it right? You can't just throw out a different Jesus and expect people to all of a sudden give their lives to the proper Jesus. That's not how it works. We have to be very, very careful. We have to be very, very careful. Again, kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. This is a big, big sign. Now, the reason why I bring this up, because I looked into who was involved with Gather House. And again, I might, might hurt some feelings with this one too, but I was asked. I received an email, and I was asked about a specific artist. And when I started looking into this artist, when I started looking into her and her husband, I realized that they are some of the leadership of Gather House, and then I started to look into who these people are, and who am I talking about? I'm talking about Charity Gale. Charity Gale. So, I did some digging on Charity, and I, I didn't like what I find, found, and I'm going to share it with you. 
Again, I don't take joy in this. I don't. I really don't, guys. I want you to understand that. I don't take joy in this. I do it all the time. I drop names and I throw these people out like this. But I don't, I, I don't enjoy this. I don't. Her name is Charity Gale, and she is a modern CCM worship singer. I looked into her background, and again, what I found was not, not good. You'll see an underlying sentence there. If I, I, I know it might be hard to read, so uh, I underlined the New Life Center Children's Choir and Advanced Children's Choir, the New Life Center Young Ladies Ensemble, and others. New Life Center. So I'm starting to get an idea of what I'm looking for. I then looked at another biography that she wrote. This is one that she wrote. And she also put, I am, uh, I also run a student theater program here in Buffalo every spring. And I, and I am on staff as music director at New Life Center in Tonawanda, New York. So I'm getting the vibe of New Life Center. So that's, that's what I was looking. And so Started looking into it. I found this new uh, the website for a new life center in the Tonawanda region, but I wanted to make sure it was the right one. And so I managed to find this from her grandfather, Reverend David A. Robinson, loving grandfather of Charity Gale. And he was the founder of New Life Center United Pentecostal Church, Tonawanda, New York. So I found the right place. He's the founder of this church that she's a part of, so it's a part of her background. So when I went back to the website and looked at it, New Life Center, under their beliefs section, they talk about the oneness of God. Again, if you're not looking for it, you may not find it. You may not see it. The oneness of God. Oneness is complete heresy, and it's pretty similar to modalism. Now, if you don't know what modalism is, or oneness, because they're pr practically, and there's, there's a little variation here there, but they're basically the same thing. It's basically the denying of the living trinity that we know the scripture teaches. The living trinity, the Godhead, God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all at the same time. He is all three at the same time. And that's what scripture teaches. That's the true belief of the Trinity. Well, they deny that, and it's similar to modalism, where God manifests himself in different forms at different times. Modalism is basically God can only be God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. He can only be one of those at any one time, and then he has to change modes to get there. Well, oneness is kind of the same thing where he has to manifest, manifest himself. As that. So Charity Gale, she comes from the background of oneness, oneness Pentecostalism, and she aligns herself with it as well. So that tells me that she has a false view of the Trinity and who Christ is. Now, I've tried to find some recent interviews of her talking about her faith. Can't find it. Um, pretty much every interview that I see is just her about her music and stuff like that. So maybe she came out of it. Maybe not. I do not know. She doesn't really talk about it. So, but if she still has that belief, she has a false version of Jesus that cannot save. And so she's writing music about a false Jesus that cannot save. You see how this goes down the chain? You see how this goes down? This is why I am so adamant about making sure, even if the song is doctrinally correct and you have the idea that you are singing to the right God, you still don't sing it. You still don't listen to it. Because it comes from somebody who has a false view of Jesus. And I'm not just talking about modern worship songs either. I'm talking about hymns too. Because there are some bad hymns from some bad people. There are. You have to be careful. You have to be careful. Right and almost right. If you, I'm going to throw Spurgeon back at you. Know, I'm going to 
throw it up there because I want people to understand this. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. We are at war with right and almost right right now. And Satan knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. I then looked into her music because I got some background. I got how she's involved with uh, Gather House, which seems to have an NIR view of things and they want to do the manifestation events and all that stuff. I looked at all that, so then I started looking to her music and discovered that she falls into the same category of modern worship, which is me worship. She's in the me worship. Now, we also can find this in 2 Timothy 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. In the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. What we are seeing with modern worship music, with CCM music, is the focus is off of Jesus, it's off of God, it's off of the power of them, and it's placed on me and what Jesus and God does for me. Lovers of themselves and lovers of money. We'll talk about that in a second, too. We know this is coming, and it's here. This hollow, modern worship music that features repetitive, cheap, jingle-like words are built to sell. This music is not built to worship. This music is not built to give praise and glory and honor to Jesus. It's not for that. These songs are built to sell. They are built to get views on YouTube. They are built to get listens on Spotify. They are built to get put into the CCLI license network. So when churches sing them, they get paid. When you create worship songs that are about me, self-centered, and focus on what God can do for me, and pair it with simple, easy to remember and repetitive lyrics, those songs shoot to the top of the charts. They're built to sell, they're built for money. And again, when we get back to 2 Timothy 3, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. The first two are right there in what is going on with worship music. Let's take a look at one of Charity's songs called A New Name Written Down in Glory. It seems to be an original that took a few lines from the chorus of an old hymn called A New Name and Glory that was written by C. Austin Miles. Um, there's like a couple lines from the chorus that they took and used for their chorus, but everything else is pretty much their own, their own writings. Probably got it from the CCM filing cabinet uh, that, that just it's got thousands of pre-written songs for all these, all these people to to sing. But this six minute song, because all these modern worship songs have to be six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve minutes long. This six minute song features over, I'm not exaggerating, features over 100 uses of I, me, my, and mine. And any reference to God, Jesus, or he falls close to 30. Over a hundred uses of I, me, my, and mine. I'll give you guys a sample. Right here, chorus. All the red. Look at that. It's, it's all about me. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. He's mine. I've met the author of my story. Oh, his name is Jesus. Oh, hey, there we go. We got something about that. But it's, a bit, again, about what he does for me. And he's mine, mine. He's mine. He's mine. Yes. Mine. My story. Yes. It's mine. He's the author of my story. I've met. He's mine, 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 mine. You guys get the, the, you seen the movie with the, the, the seagulls that just repeat mine, 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 mine. That's what this song is about. That's what this song is about. It's all about me, my story and what, he does for me. Well, if that's not enough, check out the bridge to this song. Let's 
I was just going to give you a second. Look at that. That's the bridge. And it's just repeated. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. And it's just over and over and over and over. Me, I, I, I am, my story, I, me, mine, I. That's the entire song. That's the entire song. It's not about Jesus. It's not about his glory. It's not about his power. It's not about his attributes. It's not about his characteristics. It's not about his, it's not about him at all. It's about me and my story and what he can do for me. That is essentially what modern worship songs are. And it stems from a certain specific type of teaching. Now, I'm going to throw this back up again because I'm, I'm going to make, make a point. I told you I was going to go back to, to Furtick and I'm going to do so. We take a look at this chorus. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. Remember that. Remember that. Well, when I was looking at this song and I read that, when I heard that, something came to mind because I've heard that before. Not the song. I've never heard that song before. But I've heard that line before. I've heard that teaching before. And I discovered why. I went in my, uh, my archives and I found why. Well, take it away, Mr. Furtick. But you didn't, get, you didn't get in this mirror right here. This is a mirror too. This is a mirror too. You've been struggling over external issues. But what about what's in you? James said something curious. He said, if you listen to the word and don't do it, you're like a man who looks at himself in a mirror. In the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. My maker is my mirror. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. You are not my maker. You will not be my mirror. When God said, I am to Moses, you know, my name is I am, he was trying to get him to see you are as I am. Little God's Doctrine. And they're very close to removing the little part of that. Furtick is literally teaching that when God said, I am, he wants, he, we're basically the same thing. I can't even say it. And that teaching that Furtick just put out there when it says, you know, I am and you will be, uh, you are as I am, that teaching, that's the same type of line that's being chanted and repeated in Charity Gale's bridge. I am who I am because the I am made me who I am. It's the same thing, right and almost right. Subtle, but wrong. This is what I'm warning about. This is why I talk about this stuff. The same junk that Stephen Furtick, and I'll tell you what, Stephen Furtick, I know a lot of people, uh, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer, uh, all these people. Stephen Furtick, in my opinion, is bar none, by far, the most dangerous pastor, quote unquote, out there today. He has got the young crowd wrapped around his finger. He appeals to them. He's got the look. He's young. He wears the tight clothes. He draws attention to himself. He does all this type of 
type of stuff that gets the young crowd involved. And he is teaching modalism. He teaches kingdom now. He teaches little God's doctrine. He's He aligns himself with people like T.D. Jakes and all these other people and stuff like that. This dude is dangerous. And you might be thinking, okay, you chose one one thing from him. That doesn't mean, well, here's another. Me! I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Get that off you. That's not your name. That's not your station. That's not your end. It's in me. It's in me. That was from a sermon two years after the first one I just showed you. He claims he is God Almighty. And he's teaching it to all of his followers. And anybody who has that view, who believes that that little God's doctrine you have a false view of Jesus that cannot save.